Hello class, we are back with another Wednesday video tutorial. This time what we're, we're going to do is start on project three. I know, it seems like it came around pretty quickly, but that's how things are. But don't worry about it, we're sort of building on what we did in project two, so it's sort of a natural progression. So the first thing that we're going to do once we get our little grass window open is to actually make a new map set um, so that we keep all the maps that we make for project three in their own little directory separate from project two. Otherwise we run the risk of getting too many maps. So what we'll do is we'll click the new map set and we'll just type in project three and we can hit start grass and we'll pop up. Um, so as I mentioned, as grass is starting up here, uh, what we're going to do today is to get familiar with a very important tool, the map calculator. And that's our main goal for the day. And what we're going to do is to do a sort of dry run of the predictive modeling that we talked about on Tuesday. Now, we're going to do a very simplified version today because um, we're going to be making a few, we're going to be doing a few different analyses over the next couple of weeks that will um, will produce output that you will use for your final predictive model for project three. But the basic procedure we're going to talk about today should be the same. Um, the first thing though, we're going to talk just a couple of tips. I always throw in a couple of tips for you guys is um, about map sets and how to view them or not view them. So under the settings uh, panel up here, if you go to grass working environment and you go to this one that says map set access G dot map sets, what you've got here is a little uh, panel that tells you which map sets you can look, uh, you will be able to see the maps that are in them and which ones you won't. So if there's a check mark, you'll be able to see the maps. If there's no check mark, you won't. So at this moment, if I go to add a, a map, so let me just cancel that real quick. If I go to add a map over here, I only see the SRTM in this vector, I mean, uh, the only raster map that's available because I can't even see anything in project two. Well, we don't want that. We actually want to see some of our output in project two. So this time we'll just go to settings, grass working environment, map set access, and we'll turn project two on. And now when we go to add a map, we actually see project two showing up here as a map set. And we click the little arrow. And we have all the maps that we made for project two in here, including aspect slope, uh, walking times from streams, uh, the stream maps themselves, uh, flow accumulation, etc. Uh, so I'll just stick one of these up so we can look at something here. Look at that, see? Um, in fact, let's actually show the slope map because we'll start with the slope map. Okay, so that's just a little tip uh, so you can keep yourself organized and you can hide maps you don't want to look at and you can show the ones that you do. Um, what we're going to do now is to talk about the map calculator. So first I'm going to show you what it looks like and then I'll talk a little bit more about what we can do in it. So if you go to raster, again, map calculator is only for raster maps. So you go to raster and find uh, r.mapcalc right here. And you get this different kind of module. It looks different from the other ones that we're used to. It's got basically what looks like a calculator pad with a bunch of funny symbols and then a few pull downs over here. So let's first talk about these symbols and then we'll talk about some of these other things that are in here um, after that. So I have the manual page for our map calc um, up here. And what I'll do is I'll just scroll down here a little bit till we get to this explanation of the basically the little symbols that you saw. What these are are operators, um, basically logical operators. And you'll look through them and you'll, you'll be familiar with most of them. Some of them you may not be, um, but greater than, less than, those things are pretty uh, straightforward, right? You're, you're definitely used to those. Equal to, less than or equal to, right? Um, and then you have these other ones that are pretty standard. Division, multiplication, addition, subtraction. And then you have a few that are not um, as familiar. The not, the and, the bitwise and, the logical or, right? Uh, not equal to, etc. So essentially what this is, is we can build Boolean logic. We could say, show me the parts of the map that are greater than three and show me the parts of the map that are greater than six. And we could highlight all of those things. Or we could use them to bookend. Show me the parts of the map that are greater than three but less than four. It'll really show you just a narrow part. Um, and we had a little bit of experience with this when we were just using the display commands uh, two weeks ago with the terrain analysis to just show us the high and low slope. But what we'll do with the map calc is actually encode those into a brand new raster map. So the map calc 
essentially does math on one map or more than one map, a set of maps, to create a brand new map. And that's really the point of this thing. And if we scroll down some more, we can see a bunch of other functions. So those are the operators. We have functions as well, including things like the cosine, the tangent, um, uh, turn a floating point map, uh, or sorry, turn an integer map into a double map, a floating point map. Um, if statements, if it's greater than this, then do that. Otherwise, do this, right? Uh, mode, min, max, round, all of these kinds of things are really, really useful mathematical functions that we can apply across all the map and between maps when we do our uh, expression. Now, this does take some getting used to. You probably will spend a lot of time looking through this very page I'm showing you right here to go, what does that function mean? What does it do? Um, but once you figure out the syntax for doing that, um, you'll realize this is a really powerful tool. In fact, if you get to the level where you want to make your own custom uh, modules in GRASS, you can do a lot of it by just scripting, writing code for the map calculator in, in, in a little text file that will run through things in a predefined way. One last thing I want to talk about here is the idea of null data cells. And we haven't really talked about this. Um, so in your mind, imagine uh, all the little grid cells of our raster, little data bands, and they have numbers in them. As long as they have a number of them, even if the number is zero, that is something that you can do math with. If they have nothing in them, you cannot do math with that. You can't multiply nothing by anything, right? Nothing is nothing is nothing. So any cell that doesn't have a number in it, we call a null cell, N-U-L-L. -L. And in the map calculator, that can be very useful. We can use that to mask areas out, to turn them transparent, to not propagate any mathematical equations through areas where one map has null. So if any layer, if the cell has uh, no value, and if it's null, any subsequent creation in the map calc will also have null. If any of the input layers are null in that place, then all of the outputs will also be null. It's called null propagation. And we have to be very careful about this. Sometimes we want to change null to something else. And GRASS gives us a couple special tools to do this. Um, uh, particularly, you write the word NULL -L in parentheses, and that is stands for any null cell. So you can do, for example, an if statement. If is null, then turn it into 1. That's something just to pay attention to. Um, uh, we're not going to use it at the moment, but down the line it will become probably important if you go on with the map calc. Uh, so just to keep in mind that zero is not null. Null is no value whatsoever, and they have to be dealt with kind of specially in your logical functions with all of your logical operators, but they can be dealt with. Now that seems like a lot. Let's start with some simple examples, okay? We've got our slope map over here. Let's start with exactly what we did before, which is to create a simple threshold in the map of slope, and we'll create a new map where uh, Values below some threshold will be recoded to one value, and values above will be recoded to another. So let's just go to this thing here. We'll go to Insert Existing Map, and we will go down to Project 2, and we will find our slope map. Okay. So now what we need to do is to use some of our operators over here. Now what we can do, very simply, we could probably try doing slope greater than, and then we can type a number in here. I'll just put 15. And we put, um, let's put steep slopes, right, as the name. And we hit run, and it's going to create a map. Automatically, it creates a binary map where the yellow is one thing and the purple is another thing. So if I pull up my little query tool here and I click on this, purple is 0 and the yellow is 1. So if we go back to our layers over here and we look at our map over here, we actually see, let's put our little legend for slope up here. And let's drag that guy over here. So we can actually see that that's what's happening over here. Everything above 15 is all these sort of dark blue and pink red colors. And our map has isolated them. So that's pretty cool. Let me show you one real quick tip for comparing maps, by the way, because we're going to use this uh, going forward. Under File, 
Go down to where it says map swipe, GUI map swipe. Um, we have steep slopes and you pick a second map. We'll pick our regular slopes over here and click OK. And now we see them side by side and we can actually drag one over the other. Isn't that pretty cool? We can actually zoom in if we wanted to to a specific spot like so and we can drag one over the other. So now we can actually see how our threshold is working in real time. Now it jitters a little bit, but it's pretty cool to do this, right? So this is a good way to compare two maps. So I'll leave this up over here. Um, now, let's say we wanted to have values that weren't 1 and weren't 0. We'd have to uh, make our expression over here a little bit better. We'd have to use an if-then statement. So simply we can type if course we could insert it directly from this thing here um, but we've already got this in here so we say if Hasa map is greater than 15 put a comma and then you put the value you want for if it's greater than 15 I'll put 30 otherwise put a comma I'll put another value 0 so for anything that's not greater than 15 I'll put 0 so now what we can do I'll click this allow overwrite so I'll just write over my steep slopes map and I'll get this and now when I query, that's 30 and that's 0. You see? So I can actually specify the values that I want um, when I do this particular map. So that's pretty cool. Now that's a pretty simple Boolean statement, greater than 15. What if we wanted to find only the slopes that are between 10 degrees and 15 degrees? Well, over here, we have to then uh, make our uh, expression even more complex. So I'm going to put my cursor right there after that first parenthesis, and I'll put uh, here again uh, the name of my map, Hasa 30 meters slope. If Hasa 30 meter slope is, uh, let's see, greater than 10, right? And now I need a second kind of logical operator. I need my or. We're going to sandwich with an or. If it's greater than 10 or less than 15. Actually, actually, what we need is an and. If it's greater than 10 and less than 15, and I've got to turn my greater than symbol to a less than symbol, turn it into, this is going to turn it back to 1, otherwise 0. And we'll put this now, we'll put um, mid slopes, right? And we'll hit run, and we'll get a new map where everything between 10 and 15 is yellow, and everything outside is zero. Now this particular kind of map where it's all zeros and ones is called a binary map. There's only two possible values, positive or negative, one or zero, present or absent, right? Your logical operator helps you produce that. Um, this is also sometimes called thresholding, uh, an operation we'll talk about more when we get into the imagery analysis part of the class. Uh, but basically what you can do is create as complex of a statement as you want here uh, and apply it to any input map or any set of maps and you can threshold them out. Um, for example, one thing we could do is to deal with our map of walking costs from away from the streams, right? So I'll put this up here. Now, the big question is, where do we come up with our thresholds? And we talked about this when we talked about predictive modeling and talked about the different kinds of reasoning. Inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, and abductive reasoning, right? So if we have a bunch of data observations, we would then start with our inductive approach. What I've done here, on the other hand, is start with a deductive approach. I have a set of theory that says, let's say, people will only farm on slopes that are between 10 and 15 degrees. Now that might not be a sensible theory, um, but that's what I started with, a first principle, and I've created a very simple binary model uh, by doing that. All right? Now probably a better model for farming would be just below 15 degrees, right? Anything below 15 degrees. So I will actually do that for you right here. Um, and I will call this uh, low slopes. How about that? Low slopes map. Run. And there we go, right? Everything 
is mostly yellow now. So the yellow places are our ones and the purple places are zero. So one is slope low enough to farm on, right? That's a very, very simple uh, model over here. Uh, but let's go back to our map of walking times. We don't really have, let's say, off the top of our head, any theory that tells us what those cutoffs ought to be. So let's get our um, scale up here for the walking times right here. And I'll turn my fonts to, to white so we can see them better. All right, so we have all these. Remember, these are in seconds over here. Um, so the first thing we could do is to turn our seconds map into an hours map, because hours makes more sense to me. So let's do this. Uh, streams walking hours. And what I'll do is I'll insert my streams walking times. And I'll do something very simple, just multiplication times 60 uh, seconds in a minute times 60 seconds in an hour, right? And I can just hit run and I should get a brand new map of streams walking hours. And if I get my, um, my legend to that one, now we have, oh, sorry, I hit multiply. See, this is when I'm trying to do things too fast. We have to divide them by 60 by 60 over here. And we're overwriting. We hit run. And there we go. All right, so now this makes a little bit more sense. Um, so maybe what we want to do is to just let the data tell us um, where to draw the thresholds. So what we can do is go to our raster menu item. We can go to reports and statistics, and we can find the one that says R univariate, univariate raster statistics. And we will pick here our uh, stream walking time hours. Let's just make sure we only have one, so it'll let you do more than one map in here. But we only want just stream walking time hours in here. And we'll just hit run, and we will see if I make this thing bigger, our minimum, maximum range, mean, standard deviation, variance, etc. So that tells us our average walking time is 2.75 hours across this whole map away from streams. And our standard deviation is 2.25. Now, I could use these pieces of information to help us come up with some thresholds. So let's try and do that. Let's figure out uh, what that is, all right? so. What we will need to do is to create another Boolean function. So this time I will go and find my if statement right here. And I'll enter my map name, my walking times. And let's just say I'll pick the mean value. And let's say I want closer than the mean value. So that means I need less than or equal to. And our mean value there is 2.75281. So I can be real specific. 2.75281, like that. And over here, what I'll do is I'll put close to streams, right? Let me spell that right. And I'll hit run, like so. And I have my binary map where everything that's close to a stream should be in. Uh, yellow. Let's see if I did that correctly. There and there. Let me add my streams on here so that we can make sense of what we've just done. Uh, project 2 streams. Click OK. Yeah, there we go. See, within 2 hours and 75 or 2.75 hours of the stream has now been turned uh, yellow. Now, let's say we want, we think that's OK, but we want to be uh, extra careful with our statistics, and we want to have it be within plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. Um, what we can do is to pad uh, that to one or minus one standard deviation. So what I have to do is to get my handy dandy little calculator app uh, here. And once that pops up, I'll put in my mean value, 2.75. 281, and I will add one standard deviation, 2.45, 2.4, sorry, 
085 and I'll hit enter. So that gives me a value of 5.29366. So I copy that and I can just paste it right in there and I can hit run. And now we'll see the pad goes out even further. But let's say I wanted to sandwich that. I, I have some idea that the sites are going to be located within one or, uh, plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. So plus or minus. So let me go back to my little calculator over here. And I will find a low threshold minus 0 0.2112. So I'll copy that over here. And what I will do is I will add another streams. So let's go here streams walking hours and I will put a greater than or equal to sign and I'll put my value here and I'll put my and simple symbol as I did before and I will put um, stream distance sandwiched right between the one on uh, plus one and plus and minus one standard deviation and I will hit run and now we're going to get a totally different looking thing so let me again put our streams up on top right so now what we've done is sandwiched between far away areas and two close areas and saying people don't want to be right up against the stream uh, but they also don't want to be um, super far away from a stream standard deviation is a good statistical measure but it may not be meaningful in this particular context. So you may want to figure out whether it's useful to use uh, the data just to tell you with plus or minus this one standard deviation. It might be in some situations, um, but it might not be. It might be better to start from theory, from a model, and use that uh, to derive a layer. So basically what we're at here is the point where we can combine some of these binary maps into a predictive model. So let's do that. Let's take a few of the maps we made. So let's pick low slopes and let's add it to um, let's add it to stream close to streams. All right. So low slopes and close to streams. Now we've added it together and we're going to get a value. Uh, well, let's just try this real quick. Let's just try predictive model, right? Let's just see what we get. Now we get, let me just update this guy to a predictive model. Predictive model. We get value of 0, 1, and 2, right? Because we had only value of 0 and 1 in the low slopes and only value of 0, 1 in the close to stream maps. So they added together. Wherever there was a value of 1 in the low slopes and a value of 1 in the close to streams, you get 2. And wherever there is one in one uh, and not in the other, you only get one. All right? So in this sense, we could say, okay, any values of two are uh, meet both criteria, so they're more likely for sites to be located. Now that's all well and good, but what happens when we have three and four and five and six input maps? We'll get a spread between zero and whatever the maximum number of maps is where they overlay. And it'll be hard to compare those. So I can't compare this one directly to that one saying, which is more likely, a value of 2 in this map or a value of 2 in a different map. So what we want to do is to normalize or standardize. And the easiest way to do that is simply take an average. So that will basically make it between 0 and 1 again, but with some decimal points. And the simple way to do that in the map calculator is to put some parentheses around our little addition that we've done here. And then to put a dividing symbol like this. And then we have two maps, so we divide by two. But very importantly, we want to make sure there's a decimal point right here, 2.0. So let's start with just the two like this, and we'll see what it does. It'll create a map. And let's see here. Now we have the map. This is the predictive model map but it's still only showing us 0 and 1. Remember in class I told you integer values, values without decimal places, multiplied or added or subtracted to other integer values will create integer values in the GIS. That's just the way it is. There's a sort of, not only just an order of operations mathematically, but a propagation of data types. So integers 
if there's all integers, including our binary map of 0 and 1, any uh, multiplication, addition, mathematical uh, formula will produce an integer. In order to get our variation, we need to put our decimal point right here. And now, when we hit run, we are going to get values between 0 and 1. We'll get this floating point map right here. Now, when we query this, we will have only a value of 1, a value of 0 0.5, or a value of 0. All right? So what we've done here is we've basically taken the first result, but we've made the scale standard so that values of 1 are always high, no matter how many input maps we have, and values of 0 are always low, no matter how many input maps we have. And to demonstrate this, what I will do is to add yet another value into here. I'll pick our um, steep slopes, right? And I will actually add that here. And instead of 2.0, we now need to divide by 3.0 because we have three maps that we're doing here. And I'll hit run. And now we're going to have a different output. Now it's a little harder to see, but it's there, right? This is uh, a value of 10, oh, did I, oh, that's because steep slopes was coded as 30. So instead of steep slopes, let's take our mid slopes. Sorry about that. Let's take our mid slopes. Remember, I, I changed the formula to make the steep slopes be 30 or 0. So let's do this one. It'll be more sensible. There we go. So now we have three values, possible values. We have uh, 0 0.66. We have, uh, let's see if I can zoom in here, 0 0.66 in the teal. We have 1 in the uh, yellow, we have 0 0.33 in the lighter blue, and we have 0 in the sort of dark blue purple area here. Now that's pretty cool, right? Um, as you can see, the more input maps we have into our predictive model, the more possible values there will be. And essentially what we're going to be doing is saying that anything closer to 1, our model anyway, more highly predicts. Uh, that sites should be located there. And what we want to do is to make sure that we put uh, interesting, uh, informative values into the model because it's garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you put into the model, the math will produce that. So you have to be the intelligent operator that guides all of this kind of stuff. That's basically it. So essentially what you will do for Project 3 is to create some interesting, intelligible um, input maps, all will be coded as binary maps, so you'll do your Boolean operations in the math calculator uh, on some sort of operation. It could be slope, it could be distance to streams, it could be distance to peaks. Uh, we will do view sheds and a few other things. But you'll add them into this final averaging calculation and you will create um, an output map. Um, we can be more or less complicated with that. In fact, we could for potentially say um, the low slopes is um, more important. So I'll put some parentheses and I'll multiply it by three. It's three times more important than anything else. And now I have six things to put down here, right? So I have to change that number and then I hit run. And now I'm going to get different values, right? So now these values are going to be 0.666 and 0.83 was something we didn't have before. 0.16 was something we didn't have before. Essentially what we did is we weighted more the low slope areas. And we can even do that with another one. We can say two times close to streams, right? And mid slopes are, are just one, right? And so now I have to open this up to seven. I can hit run again. And the patterns are, are staying the same. The numbers, the confidence in our map output map for predictive model is going to change based on the way we weight things. Now, you don't have to always weight things, but weighting can help you emphasize one of your input variables over another. All right, I think that'll do it for now. Um, we will see you in two weeks' time. Um, I will hope to upload a new tutorial for next week um, sometime tomorrow. However, the one from last year probably will be fine. So if I run out of time, I will just send you an email saying, look at the one from last year. Um, and that is it for now. I will see you all tomorrow.